It's Monday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me, Conservative MP Stephen Crabb, Labour MP Bell Ribeiro Addy, Professor of Politics Tim Bale, and Spectator Deputy Political Editor Katie Balls. Today, the Prime Minister urges people to get boosted as Omicron warnings continue. The number of infections is doubling every two or three days. There's going to be a tidal wave of infection. These are cues forming this morning. Can the NHS deliver an accelerated vaccine programme? As new COVID restrictions apply in England, how many MPs will back them? I think all these things are wrong, they're disproportionate, and there's inadequate evidence that they're required. And can you believe it's been two years since this? Thank you for the trust you have placed in us and in me. I did everything I possibly could to win this election. So the Prime Minister has ordered a massive expansion of the booster campaign with an unprecedented new target of jabbing over a million people a day. Um, the booster programme is across most of the newspapers uh, this morning. Let's just show you a few of them. The Sun has Omigold or Oh My Gold. Uh, Prime Minister's alert as cases surge. Boosters for every adult by end of the year. New drive to beat tidal wave of Omicron bug. And this is The Guardian. Prime Minister bets on one million jabs a day to halt tidal wave of Omicron. Um, that is jabs being offered to people, certainly by the end of the year. Um, Stephen, that's a lot of jabs. Can it be delivered? Potentially, but very, very challenging. I think you, you just said it requires a million jabs per day. I don't think we've ever got more than 550,000 in any single day, so it's going to require a Herculean effort. Of course, where I'm from in Wales, where we're under the Welsh government, um, we lag some way behind that. So I would say in a Welsh context, it's probably almost impossible, but clearly it's all hands to the pump and we'll see what can be achieved. Belle, do you think it's doable? Well, the NHS, I think, is, is amazing and it's been their success all along. Um, they've shown what they could do when you give them the resources to do it. However, they're saying today that they don't think it's possible. And I wouldn't be surprised, given all the, the other constraints um, that they face, they're under huge amounts of pressure. Um, so, yes, I, I'm not sure it is possible, especially if they're saying it's not possible. Right. Um, Katie, making a promise like this is ambitious, uh, depending, depending on how you look at it, but do you think the Prime Minister is actually thinking he is going to be able to achieve it? Um, I think he's hoping he can. I think ultimately he needs to be able to point to something. I think it was interesting that address last night wasn't a press conference where you could ask questions afterwards. Um, but previously, those addresses have tended to be for big announcements on restrictions. The issue for the Prime Minister is that should he decide that you need to go further than the current plan B and move to restrictions, it's not at all clear his party will back him. They've got to chuck everything behind the booster programme. But already that seems to be unravelling a bit today. Uh, mixed messages over it, whether it's to offer everyone a jab mm. um, in the next month or to actually just give them the offer of one and that will happen in a few months' time. So I think it does look very uphill. OK. Um, what about you, Tim? Sajid Javid, the health secretary, has said he's planning to go ahead with his family Christmas, but he is calling on people to be cautious um, and perhaps they should do things like take a lateral flow test before they go out and socialise. He said people are naturally changing their behaviours. Are you? Um, well, I mean, I think we'll have a quiet Christmas and I hope that uh, compared to last year, it'll be a little bit better when we had to just go up to London and exchange presents with our adult kids sitting outside a cafe in the rain. If it's not as miserable as that, it'll be a win as far no. as I'm concerned. Well, I was going to say, let's hope it is an improvement on that. Um, in terms of changing behaviour, interesting from Sajid Javid, you'll remember a few weeks ago, Stephen, uh, Jenny Harris, who's one of the senior health advisers uh, to the government, suggesting that people shouldn't perhaps indulge in non-essential socialising. She was pretty castigated for that, and yet now here we are. Yeah, things have moved on a lot, haven't they, in the last few weeks, and that is all about Omicron and the data that we are seeing from South Africa and elsewhere about how fast the new variant spreads and what's still unknown is how severe it will be. So I think Sajid Javid is probably right to strike a cautionary note uh, about people socialising at Christmas time if people can 
cut back some of the social contact, contacts, yeah. that might be prudent. Right, are you changing any plans? Well, we're supposed to have a, an office party on Friday and we're going to have a, take a rain check tomorrow, I think, after Welsh Government announcement to see whether it would still be appropriate to do that. Are you changing any of your plans coming up? Um, yeah, I'm just not seeing people in the way that I would usually and going to restaurants and things. Um, it's Yeah, a lot of those things have been cancelled. I think it's important to do so, but I think it's a big worry that we're, we're getting so many mixed messages around this. What counts as um, an you know, a, a, a unessential gathering? Is this an unessential gathering mm. here? Could we have done it some other way? I think this has been the issue throughout the entire pandemic. Very, very bad messaging, very, very bad um, levels of guidelines which people don't get and find too easy to break. And some people pay the price and not others. Stephen? No, I, I, I disagree with that. I think we've had pretty consistent, clear messaging through the pandemic. What no. has changed is different waves and the different prevalence of, of, of the, the variants in our society, and the government has responded to that. And the, the announcement from the statement from the Prime Minister yesterday, I think, was, was in, in, in tune with that. Right. Is it consistent, though, to say work from home if you can, but Christmas parties still go ahead? No, there's an incoherence around that, mm. OK? So uh, it is inconsistent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what the, the, the people who defend that will say that it's about actually limiting the number of hours in any one day that you're coming into contact with people. And actually, if you can preserve a bit of social life p for people, uh, then if working from home enables that to continue, then that is a, a price worth, worth paying. But I think what we're going to see in the, in the coming weeks and into the new year, uh, as the new strain uh, pushes through society, I suspect we'll see a lot more people working from home and cutting back social contact. Let's talk about some of the impact on other health treatment, um, Katie, because obviously the booster rollout is, as we've discussed, a huge task for the NHS. Um, Sajid Javid said that cancer diagnosis and care will be completely unaffected by this new mission, but admitted that hospitals would have the right to postpone elective surgeries such as knee and hip operations. So it isn't, of course, uh, cost-free. No, it's not cost-free, and obviously that's going to affect the backlog, which is already a huge issue for the Tories, particularly something they're worried about whenever the next election will be, which right now feels longer away, <laughs> um, given recent events. But also, I think even on cancer, if you are cutting down uh, you know, physical contact in terms of seeing your GP, it's not quite as simple as saying, oh, that's not at all affected. Um, you are going to have a situation where things might be missed because people are putting off going to see doctors over smaller issues. Um, so this is going to have negative impact. You can obviously weigh things up and say, well, in the circumstances, you have to move to this. But then I think you do get to questions, which is, why is it uh, the vaccine rollout initially seemed to be a great success on the UK side? Um, lots of ministers want to go in the airwaves and say how well it was going. And yet the booster programme has just been besieged by various problems and you can't help but think it could have been moving a lot quicker in the past month or so. All right, just before just before we uh, move on, uh, we did have some news from the Prime Minister who said on a visit to a vaccination uh, clinic that at least one patient has been confirmed to have died with Omicron. Um, let's talk to Dr Chris Smith, virologist at Cambridge University and presenter of the Naked Scientist podcast. He's joining us from Cambridge. Chris, can you explain why we need more booster jabs to be made available in response to the Omicron variant? Well, this variant has a very large number of genetic changes, mutations, and a very significant number of those changes are concentrated in the part of the virus genetic code that it uses to make part of its outer coat called the spike. And those spikes are how it gets into our cells. They're the linchpin to infection and infectivity. And by changing them, the virus has done two things. One, it's made itself more transmissible, possibly by becoming stickier, it's better at getting into our cells. So it gets to more people more efficiently than previous variants, which means that in a certain space of time, you're going to get more infections and therefore more cases and therefore potentially more severe cases as we're hearing one person's unfortunately lost their life. But the other curved ball here is those changes in the outer coat of the virus. Because we're using that part of the virus as the vaccine, we're educating the immune system how to target that bit of the virus and block it. If the virus changes the shape of that part of its coat, the vaccines, while they will still make an immune response, mm. it won't be quite as good. It won't be as good a fit with that part of the virus as it would have been with previous variants. And so what we're having to do is to resort to effectively quantity over quality here. The immune response isn't as good 
So you deluge the virus with more antibody and a bigger immune assault, which does help it to surmount the, the fact that this new variant looks a different shape. The way you do that is by driving up the immune response with a really hefty booster dose. And that's what the country is now doing. Right. Well, thank you very much for, for that response and explaining it. Um, a lot of people will be wondering um, whether or not, aside from the booster programme, the vaccination programme, will the current restrictions and the ones being brought in as we speak, will they be enough or will there be a need, in your view, to move to a plan C? Well, the current way we were operating was sustaining a level of transmission of Delta, which is less transmissible of some 40, 50,000 cases per day that we know about. Now, you can probably comfortably double that because remember that a, a significant proportion, perhaps as many of ha as half of the cases are going to be asymptomatic. Well, according to the UK Health Security Agency, they published some preliminary information yesterday. Mm. This Omicron variant is twice as transmissible as Delta. So therefore, if restrictions were not holding back Delta or were at least maintaining it at roughly that level, we can mm. expect to see many, many more cases with this new variant. And hence, you've got Boris Johnson talking about tidal waves. But the mitigation here, and this is based on data from South Africa, because they're a bit ahead of the curve on us, because they've been dealing with this for longer, they've had a chance to study it, is that the clinical syndrome it produces is more mild. So it's not a case that because we get more cases, we'll automatically get in step more consequences. At this stage, we just don't know. We know that the vaccines can stop you getting infected. We don't know what their performance will be against severe disease. It may be extremely robust. So at this stage, that's why governments are taking the cautious approach. But they don't want to leap too far because the data from South Africa suggests it is a very mild illness. So for that reason, it might be that what they're doing is enough and we'll, we'll keep it in check. All right, Dr Chris Smith, thank you very much for that. Let me just remind you of some of the measures. Coming in today, we can show you the BBC news story, COVID work from home guidance, if you can, reintroduced in England. We already had uh, more mandatory mask wearing in more indoor settings and uh, votes on those things tomorrow and also ahead of vaccination passports in a number of settings, including nightclubs and big venues or proof of a lateral flow test. Um, Katie, a lot of Conservative MPs particularly are not happy. Um, can you give us a sense of the numbers at the moment in terms of rebelling against these measures? Yes, yeah, so we have a rolling list on the Spectator website and now lots of MPs getting in touch almost as a badge of honour to say, look, I'm not going to vote for vaccine passports when they come to the House tomorrow. Um, I, at the moment, the number of would-be rebels who have come out publicly is just over 70. Um, pretty big number. That is going Very. to be the biggest rebellion Boris Johnson has seen since winning that majority of 80. And also we expect that number to go higher because there's some MPs who will just want to do it on the day rather than tell the media. Um, and the other thing to watch out for is uh, the payroll, because we're hearing talk that various PPSs, so the lowest rung of really um, you know, the government ladder, um, are planning to potentially uh, rebel, resign in the process if they are forced to lose their role because of this. And you could see five, ten of those. And I think that'd be very interesting because mm. it tends to be this is the newer intakes. They are the most ambitious, the ones who are quite keen to climb that ladder. So if they think as a point of principle, mm. um, they can't follow this. I don't think that reflects very well on the fact that they think it's almost acceptable to rebel on this issue. It's almost becoming um, the more fashionable thing, I think, to be part of this rebellion than not. How are you going to vote? Well, I'm going to make my intention known tomorrow after I've spoken to the whips, although I've been speaking to the whips over the past few months about this issue. So I'm supportive of the government on all of the measures that they're planning to bring in as part of Plan B, with the exception of the COVID pass. And the reason that myself and other mainstream backbench MPs who've backed the government all the way through this, the reason that we're struggling is the, the element of compulsion that comes with it. You know, the idea that we are taking a pretty significant step down the road of becoming a society that basically separates society into two groups, one group vaccinated who are allowed to participate fully in all of the, the benefits of, of mainstream society and another group who, by force of sanction and coercion by the state, won't be able to participate in the same kind of activities. Now, I completely take the government's point that it isn't a 
pure vaccination pass because you can prove through a negative lateral flow test. Uh, but still, it's not a small step that we plan to take. And, you know, people like myself who aren't libertarians, we're not on that wing of the Conservative Party, but just we have this instinctive discomfort about this step that we seem to be taking. And it's causing a lot of us, giving us a lot of reason to just pause and, and reflect on this. Right, but it's not going to change between now and tomorrow. As it stands now, you can't vote for it on the back of what you've just said. It'll be very difficult to vote for it. And I've had those discussions with the whip, but I'm going to be joining a call shortly later today with Sajid Javid and some of the scientific advisers, and I'll listen to the debate tomorrow and I'll make up my make my final decision then. I mean, there are strong arguments on the other side. I and mean, there's a great many people watching this programme right now who feel entirely comfortable with society going down that road. Right. The, the notion but, that we, but the the notion that we should... can't support it at the moment. It's going to be very, very difficult for me to, to support it. Um, Tim, listening to that, uh, Stephen describing herself as not being on the libertarian wing of the party, what do you make of MPs like him uh, minded not to vote particularly for that uh, measure, which is a Covid passport? Well, I think there is a risk um, for the Conservative Party here. I think if Omicron does what some people are suggesting it does, then I think they're going to look uh, pretty silly, actually, if they voted against uh, restrictions as they see it. Uh, when actually the public health emergency is growing ever greater every day. Uh, they're certainly not in line, I would say, uh, with public opinion. Uh, it's often, you know, seems to be the case that, you know, people don't want to wear masks or people don't want restrictions. But when you actually poll people, most people are in favour of doing anything that might help us get out of this particular crisis. So uh, I'm not sure they're, they're you know, doing the right thing um, in terms of public health. And I'm not sure they're doing the right thing Thing in terms of the, the reputation of the party. Stephen? In, in Wales, we've effectively been under Plan B restrictions the, all of the autumn, and they haven't made a discernible difference whatsoever to the transmission of COVID. Now, except that it's the Delta variant that we've been talking about over the last few months. But as I say, I support the government on all of the measures, with the exception at the moment of the, the COVID pass, because I haven't seen a shred of evidence to suggest that it makes, on its own, makes a discernible difference in limiting the transmission of COVID. No, but the reason, the reason for COVID passes, as is the case in many other places in Europe, is to actually encourage people to get vaccinated. Sure. That's the reason. In other words, it is to some extent to make people's lives a bit awkward if they don't do it, so they go off and get a jab. But that, so you just said it yourself, to make people's lives more awkward, an erosion yeah. of, of their, their freedoms, making it more difficult for people to participate fully in society. And that gives reason for people like myself just to think and reflect about, actually, is that a healthy step that we want to be taking as a society? I mean, there are powerful arguments both ways, but it's not a small step that you're describing. Abel, where are you? Um, I feel quite uncomfortable about the issue myself. I'm in favour of any measures that help keep us safe. But when we start to go down this road, I wonder where it can actually lead. Now, the Labour Party used these measures at our conference. Uh, we had we had people sh either show their COVID pass or a negative lateral flow test mm. because it was quite a large event and we were trying to... And you were supportive with, of that? Um, yeah, at the time, that was, that, that was fine. But that... Um, but that, it worries me now when we're talking about a variant that is very, it spreads very quickly to the extent that actually you can have a booster and still catch it. Showing your COVID pass is not showing a negative lateral flow test. But that, I is, think but, it's... That, but that is what the government is proposing, that you will have a choice. Um, you'll either have to provide um, a COVID passport, vaccination passport, or proof of a negative but lateral flow But then you're flow choosing test. whether or not to be very clear about whether or not you've actually got the virus. The most accurate way to tell whether you've got the virus Virus is to actually test for it. Showing a pass that you've got a vaccine is not 100% you being 100% sure that you don't have the virus. So you could be walking into somewhere with, with a COVID pass saying, I've been vaccinated, but by the way, I could still be infectious. I just don't think it's, it's logical. And also just the main issue of having mm. passes, I, I very much agree with excluding people from certain things. It's a problem. When we're talking about herd immunity, I'm not talking about the herd immunity at BC. Mm. I'm talking about achieving herd immunity in modern day. We've always aimed to vaccinate at least 80% of the population, understanding there'll be a group of people for a variety of reasons, whether they want to or not, or because of some other issues that have not been able to be vaccinated. Public confidence would increase vaccination. I don't think for Forcing people down that road is necessarily going to have the desired outcome. Well, just before I go back to you, um, Tim, does that sound like you're voting against that too? As, Do you know, like to Stephen? be quite honest, it hasn't actually been laid down yet. 
which people are finding quite interesting. Uh, the, some of the other measures have been put down in terms of the, the, the actual motion that's going to be voted on. So I'm waiting to see exactly what it looks like. Right. Um, Tim? Well, what will be interesting to see is whether the government actually has to, in the end, and given the figures we've heard, rely on Labour votes for this. It reminds me a bit of 2006 when Tony Blair needed David Cameron to come along and rescue him on, on education. In some ways, uh, I would have thought the opposition would think that was a pretty good look. They're taking what they would describe anyway as the responsible attitude mm. and helping the government out on this. Right, and that is the reality, isn't it, uh, Katie? I mean, the outcome of the vote isn't necessarily in question as we sit here now, but uh, it will be reliant on uh, Bell's colleagues. Yes, exactly. We're not looking at this rebellion saying, oh, can Boris Johnson get this through? It's how is he going to get this through? And I think as Tim touches on, it's never comfortable for a prime minister to have to rely on opposition votes. I think particularly worrying for Boris Johnson is the fact that we're talking about that booster pledge. Given the level of concern in number 10 right now about um, Omicron, it's quite conceivable that the Prime Minister decides he needs to bring in extra measures. I think they'll probably be even more unpopular, or at least uh, similar levels. And if the Prime Minister has to consistently, going into the new year, rely on Labour votes, I think things do get quite dangerous for Boris Johnson. Right, just briefly before we move on, you used authoritarian um, as a way of describing it. What, 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 what do you mean, authoritarian? Well, I think so many things that the government have passed, uh, definitely over the past couple of years, we were meant to be focusing on, on COVID, have been quite authoritarian in that it's giving the government complete control. We didn't need to pass the coronavirus act, extend it for the full two-year period, as far as I'm concerned, because there are certain measures in there the government no longer needed. So when you go down the road of attempting to force people into a particular position, especially when it comes to health, mm. that does go down an authoritarian route. And I just think we need to stop... And, 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 and take, take, take some time and actually try and win over public yeah, confidence. I'm, I'm sorry, Bella. Personally, I just don't think that language is helpful. We've gone through an extraordinary time as a country with the pandemic. We've taken decisions in Parliament that have restricted individuals' freedoms, family freedoms, business freedoms. And all of those have been very difficult choices. But in no so way I'm, I think it's appropriate I'm to call it authoritarian. I'm absolutely in favour of anything that has kept us safe, including the full restrictions. I'm for a zero COVID policy. So that's not the entirety of what I'm how, talking about. How, I'm how, saying that the government how, has gone how, down many sorry, different Bell. authoritarian routes, be it via um, immigration, your spy cops bill, all of these different uh, things. The Bell, government has turned to a very, very let authoritarian ask, how agenda, do you, how do you achieve, and they've moved well, let, it. Let, let's see if an answer. How, how do you achieve zero COVID in society without taking those really restrictive measures that you've I, just I, described as authoritarian? I didn't say you shouldn't take really restrictive measures. I said going down the route where you require people to show a pass, in my view, feels quite authoritarian. That's not being against all the other measures. But would zero I agree COVID with, not mean people, people, keeping people in their own homes? We should have locked down properly the first time. Part of the issue is that we did not lock down, um, in, uh, we didn't lock down properly, we did not lock down fully and so that meant we had to keep locking down again and again and this is why we find ourselves in the situation we are in now and yes those restrictions are absolutely right but I think I can distinguish between what is keeping well, people safe and what is authoritarian. I, I, I think lockdowns were calamitous for children for young people across society, but they were for businesses, necessary. let if we us did never, it properly, never go back If we to did it properly that. for the length of time that we needed to, we wouldn't be ending up in this situation now where we could be going to what is Plan C. All right, well, let's talk about the Prime Minister and any damage to his authority from all the revelations over Christmas parties. Let's show everyone this picture um, from the Sunday Mirror. Um, it was a photo of Boris Johnson taking part in a Christmas quiz. Um, how much damage has been done, uh, Kate? over this? I think in terms of general party gate, um, quite significant damage. Um, I mean, you can look in terms of public polling. Um, Labour have won their biggest you know, leads for years. Um, you are seeing a quite an uncomfortable margin now opening up. It's felt often when the Tories have been trouble, it's felt it's even then, it's just Labour and Tories neck and neck. But now Labour quite comfortably in front. But then I think in terms of Tory MPs, it's significant because it's seen as fitting into a pattern how they dealt with the number 10 and the parties because Boris Johnson and his team um, denied it, said all rules were followed, then the video emerged last week. I think in terms of the quiz story, which broke overnight, um, there's probably more of a mixed reception in the Tory party. Some don't think it is quite the smoking gun um, compared to others. Well, on that, in the way Katie has described it, Stephen, when you see that picture, and Tim, I'll describe it to you in case you haven't seen it, but when you see that picture, what do you, what do you think? Are you looking at a picture 
of Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, breaking the rules, breaking the law in terms of Covid rules, or is he taking part in a virtual quiz? Yeah, Joe, I know I'm supposed to feel outraged at that. I don't. I look no, at that I'm asking and, you what and, you I, see. and I see a couple of men and doing a virtual online quiz, one of whom is kind of wearing a bit of tinsel on their jumper, and it looks entirely consistent with the, the slightly rubbishy Christmas that so many people up and down the country were experiencing last year. So I don't see it as a smoking gun. There is a, an inquiry ongoing into these... Uh, alleged gatherings and parties in inverted commas in Downing Street. Let's see what the outcome of that is. And if there's more explaining that the Prime Minister needs to do, then we will expect him to do that. Right. Uh, Tim, what did you think when you saw the picture? Well, actually, I'm less worried about what's going on in that particular picture than what was going on in Downing Street more generally, I think. We don't have pictures of that. Apparently, you know, there were some 40 people gathered in a room um, looking at various monitors. If, if that was the case, then that would be a problem. I think Boris Johnson and a couple of colleagues, ironically, may actually have been proof of breaching the guidelines, but it's, it's rather less serious than what was going on in other parts of the building, I think some people would say. Uh, but certainly, yeah. it is pretty damaging, I think. What do you see? I mean, they say when it when it rains, it it pours. Um, it doesn't really make a difference as far as the Doesn't country. It, isn't it important to look at what the picture says? It is important to look at what it says, but people are so tired of all of this. They're so tired of the government doing one thing, having one rule for them and another rule for us. They look at that picture and they can't see beyond what they've heard about seven other parties. They can't see beyond the issue with the Prime Minister's flat. They can't see beyond all of these different things that make it look like the government is laughing at people whilst they had a, a, a jolly old time. We were there following up restrictions. Is that fair enough, no, Stephen? Nobody is laughing at the public. And I know some of the people who work at Downing Street, they've spent the last two years working 16, 17 hours days, many of them hardly have seen their family all year. So in that context, and not to excuse any uh, wrong parties that may or may not have taken place, but you can understand in that context why people might want to push the line a bit and just be able to wish each other a, a, a happy Christmas in, in, a, in a context that isn't purely... But purely people work. are so upset. I've had people writing to me, actually much like the time when Dominic Cummings broke the rules, again to say, I never write to my MP, but... And loads of other members of Parliament have had those emails too. Bell. They are so upset about what's happened. They're so upset that yet again... They were asked to follow a set of rules and it seemed like the government got well, to do whatever they wanted. But you're, you're talking as if you were there and then you know exactly what happened. We don't. None of the people no, sat around this don't. table this morning but it's were very there. Difficult we don't know to what understand happened. How the so let's how... stick to facts. Mm -hmm. There is an inquiry ongoing with the Cabinet Secretary Simon Case. Let's see, and I presumably we're going to hear the, the, the outcome of that by the end of the week, so let's wait. But a party the took place in the Prime Minister's house. It is his house. He resides there upstairs. He claims he didn't know it happened, but... Um, he's sure that they followed the rules. How does he know that they followed the rules if he wasn't there and he didn't know what happened? Well, that's why the investigation, of course, is ongoing. Um, just to give you a bit of detail, particularly about uh, the picture in question here, about the uh, Zoom quiz, according to the BBC, some people joined the quiz via Zoom, but multiple sources have told the BBC others were there in person and sat in groups of six in Number 10's policy unit room in the Cabinet office. They have uh, declined uh, to comment. They've been asked to comment. We haven't heard back from them as yet. When do we think this investigation being carried out uh, by the Cabinet? Secretary is going to report, Katie. So this side of Christmas, and there's now thinking that it could be the end of the week, actually, that we could hear back on this investigation from Simon Case. Um, and I think the thing to look for here is... Will we see an exodus of number 10 staff? Will some leave as a result of this investigation? Will it be a light telling off? Um, will it be a whitewash? I think part of the problem is if you look at Allegra Stratton, uh, the Prime Minister's then spokesperson's decision to resign last week after she was um, in that clip that leaked, uh, appearing to joke about a party with other number 10 aides, well, in that clip, she said she didn't attend the party. And I think, in a way, that almost raises the bar here, which is if you uh, leave your job because uh, you joke about a party, what do you do if you're at the party? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a question that Simon Case is really going to have to address in his report, whether or not he decides to follow the, the logic of that. Right, we're going to come back to this in just a moment. We're just going to break off and talk uh, to my colleague Elizabeth Glinker, West Midlands political editor, because she is in North Shropshire. There is a by-election happening on Thursday uh, following the then Conservative MP Owen Patterson's resignation after being found in breach of lobbying rules. How's it shaping up, Lizzie? 
Well, Joe, I think the events of what's been going on in Westminster for the last week has kind of intensified th things here in North Shropshire. So this campaign was kind of bumbling along. Of course, it was uh, it came about in the first place because Owen Paterson uh, was forced to resign after he was found to have broken those lobbying rules. So the background to it was kind of all the accusations of sleaze that were swirling around. Now, under normal circumstances, this would be a very safe Conservative seat. Owen Paterson's majority is just under 23,000. They've literally had Conservative MPs here for 200 years. But the Liberal Democrats have the bit between their teeth. They had a bit of a feeling that there were people who were feeling a bit disaffected here in this part of Shropshire, that they felt left behind, that the Conservatives were taking them for granted. Well, that was kind of what was happening any more anyway. But what we've seen with what's developed over the last week or so is that that has intensified even further. So the Liberal Democrats had over 500 activists from other parts of the country here this weekend. They reckon they've knocked on 23,000 thousand doors and both the Conservatives and the Lib Dems are now saying this is looking very close which if you had said that to me a couple of months ago that somewhere like North Shropshire would have been on the cusp of perhaps a potential huge upset I would have said not you know not a chance that is definitely not going to happen so it's looking now as we run up towards Thursday that things are going to be very close indeed I'd say the Conservatives are sort of managing expectations they're saying they're not taking anything for granted but they're still confident the Lib Dems saying, well, you know, it's looking good for us. And uh, in the meantime, Labour have really been pretty quiet in this campaign. Whilst we've had Ed Davey, the Lib Dem leader here, five times in the last month or mm. so, um, high-profile Labour names have been quite thin on the ground. And, and the uh, Conservative candidate has been really trying to keep his head down and focus on issues here in the constituency. Well, things have just been an absolute blaze uh, down in Westminster. Well, Lizzie Glinker, thank you for setting the scene there in North Shropshire. Only a few days to go. Um, uh, let's just show you the list of candidates for that by-election. Of course, any other information will be on the BBC website. Quite a list of names. Let's return to the question of how perilous things are for Boris Johnson at the moment. Uh, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Douglas Ross, has been talking about him. Let's have a look. You said he's the right person to lead this country uh, at this very difficult time we're facing. Can you just list his attributes? Well, he is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom, eh, as many other countries eh, across attribute. the world, are facing very difficult times. I just want to hear, eh, and indeed, hear you tell eh, us earlier, what, what you think his attributes are. Well, he's the leader of the main party in the United Kingdom Parliament, and he is the Prime Minister who has been elected to lead the country. Not the most supportive answer. Can you think of an attribute that you might uh, assign to the Prime Minister? Yeah, I think Boris Johnson, when he's on form and focused, is a fantastic communicator. He's a formidable politician. He's got that one ingredient that most politicians don't have. He's got the ability to make people want to cross the road to meet him, whereas most politicians, I think, have the opposite effect on, on members of the general public. Um, okay. The last few weeks have been challenging. We've made it more difficult for ourselves. Challenging? Yeah. and you know, Understatement of the year? Yeah. And, look, we don't want the last few weeks to set the template for 2022. And Boris Johnson himself will know that more than anyone. Right, but listening to Douglas Ross, that's a pretty damning indictment, isn't it, from the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. Um, and he's been saying similar things over the last week. That is not a vote of confidence in his own Prime Minister. Well, I'm, I'm not here to answer for Douglas Ross's No, but how views. does it look if you're, you're looking at somebody as important, as influential as Douglas Ross saying that? Well, you know, he answered that question in the way that he chose to, to do. I know that Douglas Ross values Boris Johnson and Boris Johnson values the contribution that Douglas Ross makes a Scottish leader to. Right. Um, Bell, can I just show you this? John Macdonald, former Shadow Chancellor, you retweeted it. If the Conservative Party refuses to do its duty and remove Johnson, serious consideration needs to be given to bringing forward in the Commons legislation to introduce an impeachment process. What trust is left in politics will be lost if we don't show that we can sort this. Um, is that what you want to see? Absolutely. Boris Johnson is clearly not fit to lead our country and our democracy have, has so many problems um, overall. But the fact that we don't have a very, very, uh, I'm not saying it should necessarily be simple, but a straightforward process of, of, of taking issue with a, with a leader means that we can't actively do our jobs. Right. Impeachment, though. Exactly what would that look like, Belle? Um, well, that's the thing. We need to look at what type of process it would be. But we need to be able to do this because otherwise we maintain this system where actually if you've got a majority of 
seats, and remember that's brought about by a first past the post system, mm. you can just get off and do whatever you like, which is exactly what Boris Johnson is doing, which is why we need a process like this. Right, it hasn't been used, uh, an impeachment process, since the 1800s. You were shaking your head vociferously then, uh, Tim, why? Well, it's completely absurd. I mean, we live in a parliamentary democracy, not a presidential system. Um, the way that leaders are deposed in this country is if they no longer command the confidence of uh, the majority of the House, which normally means the majority of their party. I mean, we, we don't need uh, a, a system to get rid of a prime minister because well, what the prime minister when is we directly have a, elected. What happens when we have a situation where we have this first-past-the-post system, which means that actually a lot of people become MPs, not off the basis really of the, how the majority of the country has necessarily voted? That creates a difficulty. We have an 80-seat majority in, in Parliament at the moment, and that situation was brought by people winning um, by a few votes here and there, not necessarily what the will of the country would have been if we had another, another right. system. There's not one way to do a democracy, and this way clearly isn't working. Tim? Well, I'm perfectly prepared to accept the argument for proportional representation because I agree with that myself. But at the moment, um, first past the post is the system that we are lumbered with. The Conservatives have an 80 seat majority because they pulverised the Labour Party in 2019. And really, it's the job of the Labour Party to get rid of the Conservative Party at the next election if they want the Conservative Party to no longer be. Uh, the, the people who provide our Prime Minister. I do you accept that? I, no, I absolutely agree with you with that. We, we do have to do that. We do have to have a situation where, if we want to win, we need to see off the Conservative Party. But you have to recognise the issues in our electoral system that make that even more difficult. Stephen? Sorry, Belle, it just sounds like sour grapes because Labour Party have lost their working-class heartlands. It's not sour grapes, and I don't, I don't necessarily believe that we have lost the heartlands in the way that you say they are. There are many different heartlands working, for Working-class voters have abandoned Working-class voters have not abandoned, right. Labour, Party voters have not abandoned, well, not abandoned thought, the Labour Party hold, in the way that you think. I don't want you to stop, but I... Well, I do, actually, just briefly, though, but hold <laughs> that thought. But hold that thought, um, because we're going to move on and talk about precisely um, this, how things have changed since that 2019 general election, which, believe it or not, was uh, two years ago yesterday. Let's just remind you of what the final results looked like. Um, here it is. UK results. Conservatives win majority, 365. Labour, 203. Um, before I come to you, Tim, because you've co-authored the definitive book about the election, it's called The British Election of 2019. We've been talking about whether Tory MP MPs are unhappy enough with Boris Johnson that they might be looking elsewhere for leadership. Do you think there is another leader, Rishi Sunak, could build such a broad coalition? No, we've got lots of talented people in the Cabinet who, it, it, much further down the line, may choose to put themselves forward. But every single political party, Joe, has people who, for whatever reason, find they've got too much time on their hands and they sit <laughs> around in the tea room over in Parliament and they gossip and they moan and they play fantasy politics thinking about what would, what would their own careers look like if there was somebody else as leader. But I can tell you from the MPs I spend time with who are kind of pretty mainstream Conservative backbenchers, um, not all of whom supported Boris Johnson, by the way, there's no appetite whatsoever for writing notes to Sir Graham Brady asking for a leadership contest. That is not where the parliamentary party is at. And anybody who thinks that now is an appropriate moment to think about bringing down uh, mm -hmm. the prime minister of the country, I'm sorry, it's for the birds. Right, it's for the birds. Uh, Tim, can you uh, tell us, though, it, was it all down to Boris Johnson, that victory in 2019? Boris Johnson did play a significant part in it, and it comes back to what Stephen said about his attraction to voters who wouldn't normally think about voting for the Conservative Party. But obviously there were other factors there. Brexit was a big factor, to be honest, and um, the, the Brexit factor and the Boris Johnson factor are linked. I mean, people like Boris Johnson partly because of Brexit, and people like Brexit partly um, because of Boris Johnson. He was significant in winning the 2016 a referendum campaign. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn was also a factor, to be honest. Um, just as Boris Johnson managed to pull people towards the Conservative Party, I'm afraid um, for Labour Party supporters anyway, uh, Jeremy Corbyn had the opposite effect. He actually pushed people away uh, from, from voting Labour. So there was a whole bunch of reasons. I think getting Brexit done was a popular slogan, in part because it also attracted some people who weren't even Brexiteers themselves, but just wanted the whole thing over with. 
Um, and then there were the campaign factors as well. To be honest, Labour's campaign was a, a mess, as we see. We did lots of interviews and we found that it was divided uh, amongst itself. The Conservative campaign was the complete opposite. They'd learned yeah. all the right lessons, really, from the debacle of 2017. They put forward a very unified team yeah. uh, that were very well managed and their messaging was excellent. They had a good messenger in Boris Johnson. Right, and on that message and messenger, get Brexit done, well, if we assume that that's been done by Boris Johnson in terms of campaigning, um, it's going to be much harder for him next time, isn't he, without it? Yes, and I think when uh, Cabinet recently had an away day, they were shown various polling um, and research, and it suggested that where um, the Tories still garner some credit is on the vaccine rollout, and also some still for actually delivering Brexit. But that's obviously not going to be enough, particularly when you have a less divisive Labour leader. Keir Starmer is still not massively cutting through, but the point is um, ministers were told he is less divisive, so some might just think, well, I can vote for this person. And where does that lead? Is it levelling up? That's taking a long time to get off the ground, particularly if we're now heading into months more COVID restrictions. Um, and I think there is an increasing concern that what does a Tory MP say on the doorstep? Is it tax rises? They don't want to talk about that. Um, so they need something to point to, yet the political weather is getting worse for Boris Johnson, not better. Right, well, uh, on that, let's just show you uh, this latest poll, Ipsos Mori. Starmer leads Johnson, plus 13 on most capable Prime Minister. First Labour lead on this measure, but the polls have been tightening and that is pretty substantial. Does that worry you? Not at the moment. I mean, given the backdrop over the last couple of months and all of the different controversies and issues that have come up, I would be amazed if the polls didn't show some change in mood. But I happen to believe that when it comes to who people choose to make prime minister and put into government, those that people's opinions change slowly o over time. And the realignment that happened and crystallised at 2019 of working class voters supporting the Conservative Party, that took a long time to build up to. And that isn't going to unwind slowly. But a lot is in our own hands here. And Boris Johnson, as I said earlier, will know that 2022 mustn't look like the last couple of months of 2021. So there's work that we need to do as a party to hold on to the trust and support of working class voters. But I think there's still a lot of goodwill out there for Boris Johnson. Well, I think if you're not worried, you, sh you should be. Um, we have a situation right now where, you know, th no one's laughing anymore. It's not a joke. Boris Johnson's clearly not fit to lead this country. And people are beginning to realise that in their droves. And if we're talking about the 2019 election, never have I seen a leader of a party vilified in the way that Jeremy Corbyn was. But at the same time, it was a very Brexit election. People were divided into tribes, leave or remain. And actually, whilst people think that loads of people just went off and instead of voting um, Labour, voted Conservative, what we have to realise is a lot of Labour's working class voters is the difference between voting Labour or not voting at all. Some just didn't vote. Some voted Lib Dem or Green because of their position on the referendum. So this idea that working class voters have wholesale got up and left us is, is, is absolutely not true. And we'll see and we'll see that in the coming months to come. And we're, we're seeing that now. Right. It's going to be a very different election, isn't it, when it comes, Tim? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't get too fixated on class either. I mean, it used to be the defining factor in British politics, but recently it's not really as important as it was. Age and education are much more important now. So true, it will be a different election. But I think as Bell to some extent hinted there, those Brexit identities are not just about Brexit. Leave and Remain are a uh, packages, if you like, about cultural values. And, and that kind of uh, package hasn't necessarily gone away yet. So even if Brexit is done, and some people would argue that it's not, um, actually, it still will be, in some senses, a, a defining thing for many voters. Uh, Bell, what would you be focusing on in trying to win back Red Wall voters that were lost? Well, clearly showing them how incompetent this government is by how they've actually handled the crisis. And actually but they putting, would be the ones you'd want to focus on? We'd want to focus on everybody. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. No, but, I mean, people have this idea that you can't. You can. If you have the resources to, you do have the ability to make sure that people in this country, everybody, regardless of who they are, have the very best chances in life. It's possible. We have the, we have the resources, we have the finances, if we just got the governance right. Right. When that election comes, of course, let's not think about that just for the moment. But thank you to all of our guests. That's all we've got time for today. I'll be back tomorrow. Bye-bye.